Alright, welcome. This is episode one, part two of our new series for The Sims 4. We're tying it in with our fan fiction series, Chronicles of Earth 9. And on the last part where we left off, I was just getting ready to explain about Hedda Candy's character arc. And, um, If we're watching along and you're paying attention, uh, since we had to break this into six parts, uh, when I originally recorded this, uh, I didn't know how long I wanted to make it. And I'm used to streaming uh, uh, nine hours out of the day, so um, how to package this in a way that it could be delivered in a, in a YouTube format. So uh, I recorded it in six hours, but I decided after sitting through uh, the voiceover, the first voiceover we did, I decided that we would break it into uh, six parts and deliver it in an hour because when we're actually doing recording every day, I ultimately decided to only play an hour out of the day, record it, and then it's recorded over a five day period of time. And ultimately as we go forward with the narration, um, it's done more as an extemporaneous type of uh, speaking versus a rehearsed or pre-planned uh, script, which is how I like to communicate. <laughs> and uh, before we get into meat, both as we move forward in the stories, if you are joining us from the first part to now, or if this is the first time you're watching it, um, as we move forward, I'm going to shift the narration so that it's dealing more directly with what we're actually seeing. And uh, But to give a lot of backstory to how these characters are here and why we are um, even doing it in the first place, I decided to devote maybe the first two, maybe three parts to that. <laughs> but uh, in this scene, as we started today, I had just got the game and uh, I introduced a new character called Hippolyta Atrera Ares. She, in the story, in Chronicles Earth 9, is the mother to uh, Athenata. Athenata Atreri Ares is uh, most people know as Diana Prince or the Wonder Woman in the story. And in Chronicles of Earth 9, um, starting with book 2, that's the first time in the story, at least in the original story before we started rewriting book one, uh, was the first time in the serial that we met Hippolyta physically. She was mentioned in the first book, but we didn't actually see her. And my um, genesis for this, the character was uh, because they live in a polyamorous or a hedonist society, the immortals, they live in a hedonist culture or a culture devoted to uh, pleasure because no one can die <laughs> and they live forever. Um, they don't really live in a society that was similar to what people were living in in the 1940s, at least in the US and in uh, Austria and Germany. Uh, where a lot of our stories take place. But, uh, and that wasn't done because we're uh, sick people, but uh, it was a way to contrast the mortals in the story or who we think the audience will mainly follow because that's who they can relate to. So you have to have a group of characters that are sort of extreme to that. In this case, the immortals who don't die. <laughs> and, uh, um, and they sort of lived this life of pleasure and then the mortals don't have that sort of society and so you kind of when they're coming and they're uh, interacting with uh, mortals they have a hard time relating with them at least in terms of um, they just live in a different culture <laughs> And so, with Hippolyta, I thought it would be interesting if you had it where the mother was kind of the, uh, let's 
sorry, cougar, but she was the more uh, sexual dominant uh, type of character. And uh, the daughter was the prudent type more. And that's how I've sort of written Athanata in the story is that she's not a prude, but she's more prudent. Uh, prudence is um, um, what they call practical wisdom. It's the way you apply wisdom to what you do. Just having wisdom doesn't really make you a wise person. You have to apply it in a pragmatical way to what you're doing at the time. And that's what prudence is, how to apply wisdom to what you're doing. Same thing with temperance. Temperance is about using the right emotions in the moment. <laughs> you're not getting carried away with your emotions. It's called temperance. Whereas courage is the act of doing the right thing when it needs to be done at that time and not waiting, you know, till it's convenient. <laughs> And then uh, justice is the act of uh, using the right amount of force to achieve uh, effect. Not going beyond, but just what needs to happen. And uh, not going beyond that. And so, Athanata, one of the things, one of her, I don't, I don't no, it's necessarily a dream, but one of her deep psychological uh, fixations or desires is she desires to have a committed relationship with uh, men. And uh, over the years, as we start the story in the serial, um, she's 2,800 years old in the story, and uh, she's had a lot of relationships. <laughs> And, um, but in the story, she's only had 12 other relationships. Uh, Steve is the 13th guy. And, um, the last guy she was with was a guy named Jean Fleury. He was French. And, um, he was a privateer for the French, but, uh, the Spanish assassinated him as a pirate. <laughs> in 1506, which is like five, 400 years ago in the past. And she never got over that relationship. And, um, and part of her desire to be in this committed relationship, and it kind of is opposing her mortal, her immortal duties as a celestial angel, because uh, her purpose in life is she supposed to help people through example, uh, one person at a time, um, grow as a human being, to uh, grow in some way, and so uh, inspire change in people. And uh, one of the things with the, the immortals as a whole is they can't force change on the people. They have to do it under natural law. There's a law of... Um, what's um, the prime directive that they follow, that uh, they have to, sort of like a vampire where they can't, uh, they have to be invited into the house. <laughs> they can't just affect people or they can't cross natural barriers on their own. Someone has to carry them across the barrier. That's why in Dracula, he had to have someone else carry his coffin to the ship. And then the ship and then some other person had to take the coffin and bring it to shore and when he crossed the bridges in the town someone had to cross him over because the vampires through natural law can't cross uh, natural barriers and uh, adapting that sort of idea with the immortals uh, because vampires are technically immortal but they're undead immortals with Im true immortals or titans uh, they can't directly interfere in people's lives they have to be invited into people's uh, houses, lives, and before they can render aid. So like with Steve, uh, for Athanata in the story to help him with his uh, cause, the war <laughs> against the Nazis, um, he had to invite her or ask her for help. And, and that's when uh, she could do so. 
right? And so in their relationship, because uh, her immortal uh, standing, um, she can't force Steve Trevor into a relationship. He has to willingly do it. So in 1950, when they end up, when everyone thinks she's died, because what happens to her in 1945, ninth is she throws herself in front of this. Uh, the Nazis are building this uh, portal, celestial porter. It's a, essentially a teleporter. But uh, they don't have the technology to do it, and the tools they're using are very primitive. But they build enough of it to uh, produce a singularity. But because the Allies advanced onto the European continent fast, uh, they were their laboratory was located along the Swiss out the French and Swiss Alps is where the bunker was. But there was a battle fought there, and the Allies. The French artillery wasn't strong enough to destroy the bunkers on the mountain, so she agrees to go up there and get the intelligence they need and report back where the buildings are so their artillery can destroy the building. So while she's up there gathering intelligence, uh, she comes across this laboratory. It's basically a building, and it's lined with silver. And in our fiction, silver obstructs mental abilities. So like if you're a telepath, uh, the silver prevents you from seeing through it, and it blocks uh, mental energy. And uh, silver is the only element that can injure uh, uh, magical beings and so forth. And uh, it has magic resistance. And um, in the story, that story, uh, she realizes what it is, and the Nazis... Uh, Realizing they're about to be defeated, they decide, at least in that place, the Commandant decides to use it as a bomb as the Allies advance on the mountain. They're going to detonate that device and destroy the Allies advancement. But unknown to the Nazis, uh, the singularity, if you des destroy the singularity, it'll destroy the world, right? Because it's a, essentially a black hole. <laughs> and so... She recognizing this, she throws herself in front of the teleporter, and what she does is she creates an implosion, which forces the energy inward instead of outward. And when she does that, her spirit <laughs> and her body are spread across the universe. She basically becomes one with the universe, and uh, um, that's how she ends up in another universe on a future earth what we're calling apocalypse our apocalypse is essentially a future earth and that's where dark side has taken over and this ties into her own personal story with her older sister that she doesn't know she has <laughs> in the story it's been kept secret from her but try not to go off on a tangent so when she goes away to this future earth She's gone 30 days and then she comes back. But for everybody else in the story, because of the parallax effect oh, yes, and the yes. distances involved, <laughs> they advance five years into the future. So when she comes back for her, it's just a 30 day period of time. And then for everybody else, it's five years later. And so they thought she died <laughs> because she's she was in another universe like athena all the gods and they couldn't censor anywhere in the universe and they thought she died and so when she comes back she's four weeks pregnant with uh, steve's child <laughs> in the story but everyone thought she died and part of her truth vision when she comes back um in the opening chapter she part of her truth vision and her astral projection powers, um, she can live through people's lives and, and get the truth. And so she lives through all her friends' lives and she sees what's happened to them over the five year period of time and the trauma they had to go through, um, accepting that she died. And um, 
so she ultimately decides not to interfere in that and so she goes on basically with her life <laughs> and she moves to Athens Georgia in the story to have her daughter and um, um, this creates a lot of problems for her and everybody else and then in that book book 20 which is called the story of Diana it covers a five-year period of time from when her daughter's born to her uh, five, fifth year five-year-old birthday and then the way the book ends, um, that's when she meets her real father, uh, Steve Trevor, in the story. Although there's no dialogue between the two characters, that's how the story ends. And it goes into the next book, book 21, which is the story of Joe West her, um, and how he's born. And... Uh, but <laughs> in our story, um, I kind of lost my train of thought. But uh, I'm trying to circle back to the original point with uh, Athenata. Who's more prudent than Apollida, who's more uh, uh, sexual driven and tying it with her relationship with Steve. So uh, Diana has this very strong sense of she sort of wants to have a normal life. But because she's the heroine in the story, her story arc is that of the hero. With um, the classical hero. And uh, if you follow a lot of Western stories, what makes it a Western story is that the hero is usually um, sort of a character whose sort of mindset is from the past world. <laughs> and there's what's hap usually happening in the story is the future is sort of change is occurring and everybody in the story has sort of adapted to the new way of doing things so like if you watch a lot of Clint Eastwood movies he sort of got that um, old world mentality that sort of you wrong people there's sort of a justice in that <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly but uh, um, Um, sometimes people use change as a way to uh, control people or get over people or rob people <laughs> and so you see that sort of in a Western um, story and with a Western story the basic hero arc is that they're essentially an old world type of character and they're having to adapt to the new world but in the classic hero arc uh, the hero at some point in the story or serial has to make a decision <laughs> usually in the moment or whatever where um, they sacrifice something and um, for the benefit of the other characters in the story they ha end up doing some type of sacrifice in her sense um, when she makes the decision to throw herself in front of the teleporter, right, she decides to do that. She accepts the consequences of her actions, which at that moment in time changes her trajectory with Steve. And what ends up happening is because they think she's died, everybody moved on after five years, and he's when she comes back, he's married with another woman, <laughs> and they have two boys. And the woman's they eventually have four kids in the story, and um, so when she comes back, it's um, for her. It's a very traumatic moment in her life, <laughs> and uh, she basically lost everything. Even though this is sort of goes back to the twenty-five-year-old arc in uh, 
A lot of times when people get around 25, somewhere around that age, they tend to have to make a life decision. <laughs> and in that decision, they have to choose, uh, a lot of times, do I go the family path or the path that enriches themselves, the fame and fortune path. And for a lot of people, they go the family route. <laughs> in her case, she wanted to go to the family route, but because of her celestial duties and her just who she is in nature, um, she chose to save the world. <laughs> and that really uh, destroyed her dream. But when she comes back in 1950, it's not that that one event sort of causes her to sort of go into obscurity. It's the 13 other events because up to that point in the story, she's had 12 children and all of them were mortal and they all died in the story. So um, she thought when she woke up on the 9th of April, <laughs> she thought, because she didn't, well, in our story, mortal women can get pregnant at will. Uh, they can't accidentally get pregnant. And prior to that story, Steve is injured in a previous uh, incident, and he almost dies. And she nurses him back to care because of her healing ability. And while he's healing, uh, he tells her that... Uh, one of his uh, dreams in life was to have a family and settle in Texas. And so she, you know, she thinks that, hey, that's a great idea. And so she kind of wanted to make that happen because they were in a deep relationship. And so that's why she decided to have a child. And so she ends up getting pregnant. But this incident happens before she can tell him. And it's not like... She wanted to keep it a secret. <laughs> she was going to tell him, but they're in the middle of a war, and they're advancing from France into Germany through the Swiss Alps. And uh, the war, at least in the European side, is coming to an end. So uh, she didn't really have time to say all that. And so when she goes and comes back, like when she, in book 19, the apocalypse, uh, she goes through a very traumatic event. <laughs> in that story and she merges with this other being called Roxy and then um, if you're following our farm sim stuff or if you read any of our novels or that novel <laughs> um, uh, unknown to Athenata in the story she has an older sister in the story and the original she... Wonder Woman and what happened with her is she like uh, Athenata <laughs> Um, how Athenata comes about and why they made a Wonder Woman was in 850 BCE it was during the Dark Age, the Greek Dark Ages there was a climatical event which happened worldwide and a lot of the areas fell into a famine <laughs> in a very low economic period and it was worldwide and uh, no one actually knows what happens but in Europe, in North Africa, in the Middle East, they call the invasion of the people from the sea sort of happens. But uh, Greek falls ancient Opa. before the period of ancient Greece. <laughs> uh, it falls into a dark age, and so, and what happened in our fictional story was the gods, because they have a pr this, a prime directive, and before they had a prime directive. They decided after the Trojan Wars that um, Zeus created a law that um, they, Open. they were gonna <laughs> sort of stay out of interfering in mortal lives. <laughs> and then, so oh, what not. happens with the mortals <laughs> is they fall in basically to this dark age. And um, <laughs> after a long time, uh, they decide to create this Wonder Woman to act as a, a, a example to help uh, people grow and stuff. And that was sort of their idea. And Athena wanted to create uh, the Amazons who were celestial angels 
to act as uh, guardian angels for people. And uh, uh, they needed a champion, and uh, that's how the idea of Wonder Woman comes about. And so the original Wonder Woman, um, they used Zeus, provided the uh, sperm <laughs> material uh, through Athena, who was uh, the virgin uh, titan. Uh, and Apollida agreed to carry the, uh, the, the, the baby. And so that's how they have uh, two mothers in the story. But because Zeus wasn't sort of, he wasn't as powerful as God El, God the maximally great being, <laughs> uh, the All Father. Uh, so that created flaws in um, the older sister who's Roxy in the story. But Roxy, she starts off in the story knowing that she's sort of destined for this future. And what ends up happening to her, she gets corrupted in the story. She's sort of like the Anakin Skywalker sort of story, character in the story. She becomes corrupted by the people around her. And, um, well, she ends up starting this war in the heavens. <laughs> and uh, not her personally, the people she's aligned with, she uh, it creates this war and it almost uh, uh, becomes really bad for the... Uh, Titans, but in Earth Nine's case, the Titans overthrow them, and with the older sister, they uh, to come into the physical plane, the physical existence, they have to have a body. So they take her body and they destroy it, scatter it across the universe. So she's a wandering spirit without a body, and that's what happens in Earth Nine, and then when they make Athenata the second one, they keep that, they erase all that from uh, mortals. And, but in reality, it all happens in the heavens, so the mortals aren't really aware of that. <laughs> but what happens in Earth is it becomes a very chaotic period for the mortals without guidance, celestial guidance. <laughs> and that's what happens in the Greek Dark Age. And, um, but the Titans, the Council of Elders, they decide to keep that a secret from Athenata because, well, she hadn't been born yet, but so that she doesn't become corrupted like uh, uh, her older sister. And that's why when she's born, she's born the first 25 years of her life, she spends away from men. She lives a normal childhood but she's away from people and she's isolated. And, um, and that's all explained in book five, The Trials of Athena. That's where you get that backstory. But, uh, but when she goes to Apocalypse in another universe, that Roxy, what happens to her is as she overthrows her, that's how Darkseid came to power in that on that earth but he comes to power much later but uh, the result of the war is what brings him the power and she's one of the people that help him because she wanted to get revenge <laughs> and um, but after Darkseid gained power and they imprisoned all the Titans and um, he turned on her <laughs> basically and he destroyed her body and he that's why when Athenata meets her in he that abyss Grant. Um, Grant. she's a wandering spirit but she'd been living in there for thousands of years at that point and so she's losing connection with the physical realm because she's a wandering spirit and um, when Athenata comes along, they merge as a symbiote being, and that's how Athenata in the story is able to overcome Darkseid in the story, because they become a symbiote being. So you had these two <laughs> celestial beings who are the Holy Spirit. Athenata is really the Holy Spirit, and uh, um, but they merge together into one being, 
And that's why in book 20, in the very beginning, that's why God El comes to Athanata in the very beginning of the story. And uh, because in the story, she has the ability in the power to change her fate. <laughs> but the way we do during our time stories, like time travel and stuff like that in Chronicles Earth 9 is when you change the future, it only changes for you. Although the other people are in that universe, it only affects you personally, right? So, um, she has the power to change her fate, but if she did that, then it would destroy everybody else's fate, <laughs> right? It would change the fate. And so, uh, God L doesn't want her to do that. So he asked her in book 20 not to do that. He has, she has to let Steve Trevor go or um, tip, tip. it'll throw everything out of chaos. But in the story, God L is her actual father in the story. And they don't actually meet until that moment in the serial in book 20. But prior to that, her only connection with her father was he talks with her in her mind, like when she's thinking in the back of her mind, he talks with her. And in book 20, it's sort of explained why you never get to see them together, or why they can't be together. It's because of her power of truth and her power of empathy and part of her healing powers. Uh, when she meets God El, she hugs him in the story. And um, in that moment, because her powers are strong, she learns the death, the day her unborn daughter is going to die. She learns uh, how she lives her life, when she dies, how she dies, in the exact moment, and the circumstances that arrive to that moment. And so when she starts the story off, and she comes back and she realizes that it's five years later <laughs> and uh, everyone thinks she's died. It's one of the reasons why she goes off to Athens, Georgia. And uh, she feels, because Steve already has uh, children, um, why burden him um, with the knowledge that you have a, a daughter and she's eventually going to die. <laughs> and then um, um, she decides to just go off and have her daughter and sort of enjoy the moment. Even though she can change the future, she decides not to. And it's mainly because of her talk with God L and she decides to live with it. And, um, and that's how the two characters end up separated. And to tie it back with where we started, <laughs> if you can remember, um, when she meets Steve Trevor in the story and they start their relationship, she is reluctant to get in a relationship because she kind of feels that that's not really her life. So she, when she meets Steve Trevor and with the help of Hippolyta, her mother, she decides to uh, go live this life with this guy. And uh, so, that's sort of where she is in the story. So when Hippolyta comes in the story, uh, she's very aware of this. <laughs> uh, Edda is not aware of the whole story. Uh, Steve knows that there were, she, she knows the story of Jean Fleury, at least the basic aspects of the story, but that comes along in book six where they have the story of the pirates. <laughs> uh, and uh, that explains the backstory of Jean Fleury to the other characters. That's when we learn about him more. And then so, um, and her children. Um, so, that's sort of why Athanata is sort of fixated on this whole um, one man, one woman. I thought it would be funny if you had, or interesting, <laughs> you had this character who was a hedonist and could be with as many, she could live in a polyamorous relationship, right? And she's a pagan in her story. She's not a Catholic in the story. 
and she's devoted to God <laughs> in the story, which is weird. But because he talks with her and he he doesn't like give her orders or anything like that, he basically uh, suggests things here, and he she follows him. And it's sort of her character as a Libra. She's a neutral character, so she's not like tied to any specific thing. And one of her character flaws in the story is that she's a very duty bound character. <laughs> and then in book 20, her and Apollo get into it, not in a hateful way, but Apollo, uh, once she realizes her daughter is alive, because when Paul that connects back up with uh, Athenata in the story, it's 10 years later. And she's thought the girl was dead for 10 years. And so when Hippolyta finds out that Athenata is alive, she's sort of, uh, I think she would do what any mother would do. <laughs> she was really hot. <laughs> she was like, what the hell? And, uh, and when she found out that Athenata is living in Athens, Georgia, uh, she goes there. <laughs> and confronts her, and um, um, and it's, it's not like funny in a comedic sort of way. It's funny in a sort of uh, um, uh, the mother wants to know <laughs> why are you hiding from me? Because the father feels that maybe uh, um, has she wronged her in some way? <laughs> why didn't uh, she's like? Well, why didn't you come to me? I'm your mother. And uh, and that sort of creates, I don't want to say a rift between the two characters, but it starts sort of a path in her life where Diana sort of cut Hippolyta off from her life. And she kind of had to because of the circumstances, she, um, mainly with the daughter. And then um, so... Um, In the 1940s, circling back, Hippolyta <laughs> um, is more of the go-getter, and Diana's really committed to this relationship. And in the polyamorous relationship, that allows us as the reader to sort of see that Diana is from this culture of hedonism, hedonist. And she, the one man, one woman sort of relationship. She knows it, she's aware of it, but it's really n not her life. <laughs> I don't know how to really explain that, at least in a Sims narration. I do in the story when you're reading it, but uh, in a lot of movies and stories, you have people where you're sort of born to a certain life, and that sort of follows that sort of idea. There's certain people who are built for a certain type of jobs. And for Athenata to do her job, which is a celestial healer, a archangel in the story, um, she can't really be bogged down. <laughs> she has to really live for other people. And her, I call it moments in the sun, are very um, short and in the longer story, how she becomes important with the Justice League of America is that in the 1940s, you're seeing the formation of the Justice Society of America. And Argus, Argus is the back-end government side of the Justice Society of America. They're the covert side. And the public face is the Justice Society. And that's where the house becomes important. It's their headquarters. And that's what we're building in Sims 4 is the Brownstone Estate. And uh, uh, Hippolyta is the one that buys the property from Elizabeth Wayne. And in book two is where we start the Wayne history. And you go through uh, who they are, where they are, the family. And by the time you get down into the Bruce Wayne time, he's born in 1980 and his parents are killed in 1988. And he becomes Batman in the story, not because his parents are killed, that's part of it, but his mother is uh, Martha Kane, and her mother is Catherine Kane in the story. And Catherine Kane in the 1940s and 1950s 
is the original Batwoman in the story. And um, she's part of the Cain dynasty, which is one of the big three families in uh, Gotham, if you follow Batman lore. Uh, there are three big families, the Cobblepots, the Waynes, and the Canes. And, uh, and the Canes are named after the writer, Bob Kane. He's the creator. And so I decided to make him a character in the story. And he was the husband of Catherine Kane. He's the one that's killed off in the story and why she becomes Batwoman in the story. And then later on, she meets another guy <laughs> in the story, and uh, he's a doctor. And um, um, as she becomes too old to be the Batwoman, her daughter uh, takes over the role of Batwoman. And um, she is Martha Kane. And she falls in love with uh, Patrick Wayne, who's the grandfather of Bruce Wayne. She falls in love with his son, Thomas Kane, in the story. Now, in our story, you actually meet Patrick Wayne and his brother, Silas Wayne. And uh, in the 1940 story, um, Thomas isn't born yet. He's born in the 1950 stories. And... Um, And so that's how they come about. And you see the early childhood of Martha Kane and uh, uh, Thomas uh, Wayne and how they fall in love. And she's essentially the the street fighter hero. And she works with the Justice Society of America. And he eventually, he's a doctor. And that's sort of how they fall in love. Is she, He's always uh, nursing her back to care. <laughs> and... Um, um, that's how they meet in the story. And when they're killed off in the story by uh, Caramon Falcone, it's because Vincent Falcone, he's our uh, main villain uh, mobs character in the 1940s. And his wife is Celine Kyle, who's the mother of Selena Kyle. And uh, her story really begins... He starts in book two, but the meat and bones of the story is in book three and book four. You get her uh, background. But uh, uh, in terms of Batman, why he became Batman, it was because of his mother. And the Wayne's family tied to the Justice Society and how they grow. And then when Superman comes, uh, Kal-El in the story, it's he comes in 1989. And he grows up in Smallville. Our Smallville is in Tennessee. That's where we placed it. It's up in the Stone Mountain, Tennessee area. We made a fictional version of uh, the Kent Farm, which I made in Farm Sims 19. And I used, uh, it's actually a German map, but we used it to model our fictional Smallville, which we put in uh, Tennessee, in near the Oak Ridge, Tennessee Valley. And, uh, that's where we Should put the Kent Farm at, <laughs> and, uh, uh, which is near Athens, Penny Georgia, and uh, do uh, same area of the country as uh, Baltimore County, yes. even though Baltimore's in Maryland. <laughs> uh, by area, I mean it's, it's kind of the same region, uh, west of the, or east of the Mississippi. But, uh, um, in the long story, why she's important, why she can't marry Steve Trevor is because she ultimately becomes sort of the mentoring character for a lot of people from 1954, 1955, moving forward. And why that is, is because the metahumans even though they're born with powers, they have to be trained, sort of like in Star Wars where you had the Jedi. They had the Force, but someone has to train them. They have to have a mentor. And so on the lawful side, you have a, uh, there's a group of uh, immortals that train them, and they're uh, justice. And then on the chaos side, there's a group of 
immortals and chaos align with that and they help train them and uh the amazons are neutral characters and with asanada she becomes sort of like the yoda character in the story where she's a a really good mentor and a real co good combatant and she trains a lot of people, both uh, villains and Melba. heroes. The bull. <laughs> and, her and one of her mentors, uh, uh, people she ends up training, both uh, Bruce Wayne and uh, Cal El. Oh. <laughs> is, uh, Superman oh. is going to be the first male Angelico uh, 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 character in the story. Because right now in this story, all the Angelico beings, and the ones that work for Athena are all females. There are no male angels, at least archangels. Uh, there are female angels, and, or male angels, and male archangels. But in terms of how they relate to uh, the story with Athena, uh, they're all females. So, uh... Cal L is like the first uh, male version of that, and um, and uh, because he came from a like Martian Manor, Manhunter, they become these beings that are called originals, and uh, part of his problem in his story arc is he has to die before he can really fulfill his uh, powers come to fruition, his immortal powers. And part of his problem and why he's affected by kryptonite in the story um, is because he's still mortal <laughs> in the story. So uh, that presents a lot of problems for him. But uh, she, in her story arc, she's essentially becomes a mentor to a lot of people. And in doing so, this prevents, um, over a long period of time, prevent dark side from taking over the earth and prevent the development of apocalypse but in the other universe that didn't happen there wasn't a Diana in that story and that's why it turned the way it did and uh, when she merges with Roxy uh, the elders appear that uh, her sister Roxy will come back because there is a Roxy out there but she's been her body's been destroyed and her spirit has been uh, entombed <laughs> and uh, they fear that uh, Athenata is gonna learn the truth and they don't know what she's gonna really do with that but I haven't decided that I think from a dramatic point of view, it would be better if Athenata didn't know. So, because of the character she is and the powers that she have, it's easy for people to get the idea that she's all knowing and she's not, <laughs> right? And uh, it would be a way to demonstrate that she doesn't know everything and she's powerful, but she's not all powerful. So there are limitations to her and it's because of mainly her age and um, her will, she wills not to be all powerful. So um, it w I thought it would be good that if her older sister came along who didn't have these qualities, right? And you could, from a psychological level, you could see and compare and contrast the two characters. And really what makes uh, Athenata unique as a character is her sense of duty she's not really too committed to one thing or another right she's focused <laughs> right uh, she believes in herself she has uh, confidence but she's not too attached to things because of just the life she's led right everyone dies around her so she really through experience she sort of understands that she has a place in the universe and that she, even though she would hate it and dislikes it, she has to just, that's the way it is. <laughs> and she kind of lets it go and that's why 
in book 20 and book 21, she gets into it with Hippolyta because Hippolyta doesn't want to accept that her granddaughter is going to die. But in the story, Athanata is the only, and God's the only one that knows the day and why. And Athanata doesn't write it down, she doesn't tell anybody. They only know that the daughter's going to die, and um, Hippolyta doesn't want that to happen. So they start butting heads. Because <laughs> Hippolyta is um, not an arrogant character, but she's. She loves life. She doesn't like to lose. <laughs> and, um, she has a lot of pride. And uh, she's a Leo in the story. And uh, she doesn't want to accept that her granddaughter's uh, day has been. Her fate is determined, predetermined, predestined. And um, that's something she's going to have to struggle with in the story. <laughs> But uh, circling back to Steve here, uh, where we started with our explanation here, um, when we brought Hippolyta into this Sims 4, um, it was the second day I was playing and I was trying to figure out how, how do you get immortal characters, immortal characters to work together. I was trying to figure out how to do the immortal stuff. I eventually did. And uh, what ends up happening is in the game settings of Sims 4, the current household, you can turn off their aging and it will advance the aging of the people outside the household, right? So what I have to do is I have to make a household with just the Amazons or Immortals. And then I'll have to make a separate household for Etta Candy and Steve Trevor. And then you can mix match households. So you can still build a brownstone estate and then uh, build it in a way that the Amazon characters don't age, but the humans age in the story. But the way you have to set it up is very strategic. <laughs> now, as we went on past today, the six hours that we're going to sit through, uh, the six parts, uh, I go on to add Donna and I put the house next door. And that house I started building in a modular way, which is what I really want for the Brownstone Estate. But for this to get going, I went with the standard uh, rectangular type of house, ranch style house. And uh, as I've been playing and developing it, because you're, de you're building it at the rate that their incomes are in, um, I want to convert this house to a modular type of house, but I didn't really know how to do it. And so I'm using Donna's house to do that. At right now, I've played for several days and I added Alan Scott's character into the story and I built a separate household. So I had to build another house for a John Jones and I had to build another house for a Jay Garrett. Jay Garrett owns a club called the Known Man's Land. That's where the metahumans all hang out and uh, uh, and stuff. So he, he, they're all part of the Justice Society, them in, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, Dr. Fate, um, something Kent. <laughs> I have a whole thing I'm developing for that, which I think is pretty cool, but uh, we'll go into that at a later date when we actually develop it, but right now in Sims 4, as we focus more on the game and less on uh, the Chronicles of Earth-9 aspect, uh, I s started redesigning the house. At this point, I just got the laundry stuff, and I was trying to figure out how to do it, and so you now have four grown adults living in this place. Two of them work in the same place. One's a, a fitness 
a health person, and the other is a business sort of person. Eventually, I, I want to have Etta in Holiday College, but I don't have the university pack, so I can't do that. <laughs> so right now, I have her as a business person, and uh, uh, she kind of works a different schedule than Steve and uh, Athanata and Hippolyta works on the weekends, at least at the very beginning of this, but she gets promoted. In the in the first six parts, so her hours she actually has great hours compared to everybody else. Two of the people work for the government, <laughs> so their hours are set. They work from seven to three. So at this point, I'm uh, really figuring out the laundry and how it works with the baskets, clotheslines, and I eventually figure it out. <laughs> it took me a long time, but uh, it wasn't very. Uh, straightforward but at this point in the story I didn't know that people could trap in the story like you could get in your car and go places <laughs> I sort of figured it out towards the end after I redesigned the house here I redesigned the bathroom layout and moved all the women into one bedroom so y'all could socialize together and then uh, Steve sort of stays in that one spot but uh, the kitchen at this point is version 2.0 <laughs> I eventually get to a third uh, reincarnation but I have to do it because I'm limited by their uh, household budget <laughs> so that's sort of where we are in the story but in the current episodes that we'll be getting to uh, we're focusing on Donna and Alan Scott a little more and I'll explain them a little more in detail when we get to those parts but for now we're gonna carry on we're coming to the end of part two part three we're gonna be a lot more focused on what is happening actually in the game here because we're getting into the meat and bones of it so uh, that's where we are At this point, I'm studying more of the like the games giving you like comfortable socializing. I'm trying to develop a work uh, workflow so when they come home from work, the stuff they need to do so that one character is not doing everything. But at the same time, I'm trying to give them I guess structure. <laughs> So you have these four grown adults and laundry kind of impact. How I ended up with laundry, I'll explain that more in part three. Because we're coming up to the end. But uh, originally I didn't have laundry and it dawned on me that uh, why doesn't the game have laundry? You know, when you, in the real world, laundry is a major thing that people have to do, right? Other than go to the bathroom every day <laughs> and eat, and go to a job. Laundry is one of those things that everybody has to do <laughs> Steve collapsed on the floor there I should say at this point I didn't know that beds and sofas had comfort levels and relief levels <laughs> I slowly started to realize it uh, as my first as the time went on in this uh, episode, uh, I had got the game the day before, and today I kind of really understood a little more, but today I was like really getting into the meat and bones of the game. <laughs> the six hour, that's kind of why we ended up with the six hour shoot. That and I lost track of time. <laughs> I was like into the game, and I was like, what the hell? The next, you know, it was like six hours later, and I was still recording. This was recorded on uh, the Bandy Camp on our PC. One of the reasons we're doing all these videos is because we can't stream our PC games and we play them a lot and my solution was to just shoot videos on them until we can stream them. 
anyway remember to like comment and subscribe hit that notification bell and a special thanks to our patreon contributors who donate their real world money to our endeavors and uh, we thank you thank you thank you see you in part three